Welcome everyone. My name is Joelle Larson and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Science and Engineering. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Curiosity Drives Progress Lecture, Giants of Earth and Space. Before we get started, I have a few, a few housekeeping items to cover and then we'll get to the meat of the presentation. First, if you wish to call in and listen by phone, you're able to do that by following the instructions on the screen. Please dial 651. 372-8299 and enter the webinar ID 927-3551-0801. Those instructions were also in the reminder email you should have received from Zoom about an hour ago. We hope to have time for questions following the two presentations today. If you have a question, please use the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. Please don't use the chat for that function as our speakers and moderator will be looking at the Q&A for those. Um, if you have any technical issues today, you can put those in the chat and one of my colleagues will assist you. As usual, we'll be recording today's presentation and we'll send a link to everyone who registered for the event. Usually takes us about a week to get that video up and cleaned up and sent to you, but take a, look, take a watch for it next week and please feel free to share that with anyone you think would be interested. And finally, we do have the live auto transcript function on. And if you don't wish to see it while the presentations are occurring, you can go down to the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and choose to hide it. And now it is my pleasure to introduce College of Science and Engineering Dean Mas Kave. Mas Kave has served as the Dean of the College of Science and Engineering at the University of Minnesota since 2018, and he held various roles within the college for more than 45 years. Before serving as Dean, he was Associate Dean for Research and Planning, and prior to that, he was head of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering from 1990 through 2005. Dean Cave joined the Electrical and Computer Engineering faculty in 1975, and he has been a huge asset to our college ever since. So Dean Cave, I invite you to go ahead and unmute yourself and take it from here. Thank you, Joelle. And, um... Good afternoon, everybody, and, and it is afternoon. Barely, um, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you're all doing well. Um, it is really my honor and privilege to welcome you to, to today's installment of our Curiosity Drives Progress lecture series. As you probably know, the purpose of these series is to showcase the breadth of incredible research being done across the college by emerging new talents, as well as seasoned experts in their fields alike. As Dean, as was mentioned, as Dean and Associate Dean for Research and Planning for the College of Science and Engineering over the past 16 years, I have been absolutely delighted and quite proud of the groundbreaking work that goes on across the college in all of our 12 departments, uh, the history of a science and technology and medicine program, as well as our research centers. I don't have to tell you that this past year has been, brought a lot of uncertainty with it in, in how we uh, operate. But I can also assure you that our college's research has continued um, essentially uninterrupted. In fact, our faculty are tackling some of the most important issues facing us right now, while rising to the challenge of delivering a world-class education in new and innovative ways. Today's science and engineering challenges demand creative and educated minds, innovators who ask critical questions and work tirelessly to discover the answers. CSE's faculty and students are pushing forward the frontiers of discovery, and we'll be hearing some of that today, redefining what's possible and making transformational impacts on the lives and well being of Minnesotans around the nation and the world. And now I'd like to turn things over to Rob Graber, an alumnus and longtime member of the College of Science and Engineering Alumni Board to introduce today's featured speakers. Rob, take it away. Thank you, Dean Cave. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Rob Graber, uh, 
and I am a member of the CSA Alumni Society Board, and we help to organize the Curiosity Drives Progress Lecture Series uh, in conjunction with the Dean's Office. And while we're all, we are all eagerly awaiting for the day when we can get back to hosting these events on campus, uh, I'm pleased that we can have so many of you joining us via Zoom. Uh, as Dean Cave mentioned, we began this series uh, back in 2018 as a way to highlight the breadth and diversity of the research being done at the college. Uh, today, in a great example of that diversity, our speakers will be discussing both our understanding of space weather within our solar system and the influence of solar flares and the biology of dinosaurs as examined through microscopic analysis of bone cross section. Um, so it is now my great pleasure to introduce our speakers in the order in which they will speak. Professor Lindsay Gleasoner earned her undergraduate degree in physics at San Francisco State University and her PhD in physics at the University of California at Berkeley. She joined the faculty of the University of Minnesota as an assistant professor in the School of Physics and Astronomy in late 2015. Dr. Gleasoner analyzes data from ground and space-based solar observatories and also develops technology for new instruments. She's the principal investigator for X-ray instruments that fly on sounding rockets and small CubeSats to study the sun. Our second speaker, Professor Peter Makovicki, received both, both bachelor's and master's degrees in biology from Copenhagen University in Denmark and a PhD in earth and environmental sciences from Columbia University in New York. He joined the University of Minnesota in 2019 as professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Dr. Makovicki is a paleontologist who studies patterns of biodiversity and macroevolution in the fossil record using a combination of anatomical and evolutionary methods as well as dinosaurs as a model system. He's conducted field work in China, Argentina, Antarctic, Antarctica, as well as in the US and his work and in his work has named more than a dozen new dinosaur species. I really look forward to hearing from both of our speakers. So let me turn things over to our first speaker, Professor Gleasoner. Thank you very much. And I'll just share my screen. Okay, thanks very much Rob for that introduction. And thanks to the alumni for giving me the opportunity to share this work for, with you today. Uh, what I'd like to do with this talk is to tell you about some really cool work that students are doing at the University of Minnesota to build small satellites that go out and make new discoveries about what's happening on the sun. In order to do that, I need to tell you about two topics. The first is going to be a little bit about the sun and the explosive solar flares that sometimes happen on it. Uh, I like to think of the sun as a, a really convenient nearby laboratory for studying a lot of different astro astrophysical processes. But yet that's combined with a very real and practical application of studying the impact, and I mean that literally, that the sun can have on the Earth system. Uh, after that, I'm going to tell you about the work that the students are doing to build new instruments to explore these topics further, in particular by the design, fabrication, testing, and actual flight of small satellites. Okay, so let's start out with a, a little movie here. You know, I like to think of the sun as a, a pretty good nearby neighbor to have. You know, it tends to shower us with the light and warmth that we need to survive, but it can also be a little bit moody. What I mean by that is that sometimes the sun comes out with outbursts like solar flares, which are very sudden bursts of radiation. And this radiation is across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And sometimes that's associated with actual ejections of plasma from the sun, like you're seeing in this video, and we call those coronal mass ejections. Uh, when those ejections happen, if they happen to be headed our way, then they can and do run into the Earth's magnetic field. And that can have a, a great deal of consequences, uh, particularly things like uh, the possibility to damage power grids for quite a long time, uh, the possibilities for high radiation levels in space. Uh, so that's a concern for satellites, including communication satellites, astronauts, etc. And so, as I mentioned earlier, there's a practical application as well as astrophysical interest in trying to understand these things. Now, a cool thing about studying the sun is that unlike any sort of astronomical object outside the solar system, you can actually sometimes get a look at the sun from more than one angle. Uh, so that last view that you saw was actually of the same coronal mass ejection, but it was looking at it from a different viewpoint because the spacecraft was not at the Earth or near the Earth, it was elsewhere in the solar system. 
And Minnesota is very involved in a lot of the instruments and spacecraft that produce images and make measurements from those locations. Uh, Minnesota each, even has an instrument uh, that is on that spacecraft that sees the sun from a different point of view. Uh, so the University of Minnesota really is all over the solar system. Okay, what I wanna do next is actually back that up. And let's go in reverse all the way back to the beginning. So we're gonna zoom back in on what's happening back at the sun when this whole thing kicked off. And what you're gonna see is what's commonly observed, which is a sudden burst of radiation at the very beginning of this event. And that radiation is pretty high energy. It's in the X-ray range. Uh, and that means that these high energy X-rays are produced at the energy release site. This is something that's being emitted at the time that this whole event kicks off in the first place. And that means that studying those X-rays is automatically interesting because it can give us some sort of idea about how this whole event starts in the first place. Okay, so what is it that we think we know so far about solar flares and these coronal mass ejections? Well, one thing that we all tend to agree on is that the, the thing that causes solar flares is the buildup of magnetic stress in the sun's corona. Uh, the corona is the very low density plasma uh, that is sort of everything outside the surface of the sun. So everything out here is the part you can actually see in a solar eclipse. Uh, and a lot of the time, um, the magnetic field of the coronal the corona is pretty quiet. It's unstressed. You can see these nice looking perfect loops over here. Nothing much is happening over there uh, because there's not a buildup of much stress at that point. But when stress does build up, then you can get what you're seeing going on on the other side of the sun, which is a sudden solar flare and an explosive release of energy. Uh, we sometimes like to compare this to earthquakes, although that's happening in a, a very different environment, a different state of matter. Uh, but it's, it's a nice analogy because you can get stress building up for quite some time, but then at some point it suddenly releases and you get an earthquake. And similarly, there's a lot of interest in trying to predict what are the exact conditions under which you finally get that earthquake or you finally get your solar flare. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes these flares are associated with plasma ejections where you actually see a large quantity of plasma being ejected. And this is coming from the same reason, that buildup of magnetic stress and then a reconfiguration of the magnetic field. And we always like to throw the earth to scale on here just to get an idea of what kind of uh, distances we're talking about. Here's the earth in comparison to one of these flares. Uh, this is actually a pretty big flare that was so bright that it saturated the camera we were using to look at it. Okay, now how can we use those x-rays that I mentioned at the beginning uh, to try to get a handle on this? Well, I always like to say that depending on what you're interested in studying on the sun or any other astrophysical source, uh, you should choose your wavelength of light carefully that you're using to look at this. And that's because if you look at the sun in different wavelengths, you're gonna see different things. Uh, all of these images were taken with the same spacecraft, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, but they're from different instruments and different parts of those instruments. Uh, so down here, this is uh, visible wavelengths. So this is what you would see with your own eyes if your own eyes were a really awesome telescope. Uh, and then next to that, we have some ultraviolet wavelengths and extreme ultraviolet, which are our higher energy wavelengths. Uh, and you can see that the sun looks very different in those different wavelengths, depending uh, on what those are sensitive to. So if we're interested in studying the high energy aspects of this stuff, then it makes sense to use the highest energy light that we can. Uh, and in our case, that's x-rays, particularly high energy x-rays. Now, these aren't exactly easy things to measure, as you probably know already. X-rays have this pesky tendency to either just go right through things or else get absorbed in materials. And that's why they're so useful for doing things like medical imaging. Um, that means they're a little bit difficult to observe. They're uh, hard to reflect in a traditional telescope. Uh, and that's why a lot of people don't study them, to be honest. Uh, but here at Minnesota, we're very interested in what x-rays can tell us about how a flare starts in the first place. And so we really dive into the x-ray regime to try to understand that. Uh, the particular x-rays that we see come from collisions between electrons that have been excited by the flare and the nearby ions in the plasma, and we get x-rays out of that process. 
Uh, what that means is that if we look at x-rays, which are the blue in this image of the right, we're going to see the parts of the sun that are most energetic. That means the hottest plasma or the particles that are moving the fastest. And the rest of this that you're seeing in the red and green wavelengths are the places where things are relatively quieter and you're not seeing as much magnetic stress. Okay, now after that brief coverage of some of the interesting stuff that's happening on the sun, I now want to move on to telling you uh, what we're doing with these small satellites to try to observe these things. And so first I need to explain what a CubeSat is. Uh, a CubeSat is short for Cube Satellite, and it's a small satellite that fits a, a very specific form factor. The basic building block for a CubeSat is what we call a 1U or 1 unit. Uh, this is a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube. And then we build that up in multiples of that basic unit. So you can have a 2U or 3U or 6U or who knows how many U is the maximum that you could try. People are trying bigger and bigger things all the time. Uh, and this is sort of a, a basic form factor that a lot of people have agreed on to use. And why is that important that a lot of people are using the same thing? Well, the way that CubeSats get to space is a little bit different from how bigger spacecraft tend to get to space. If you have something that's only about the size of a shoebox, you don't necessarily need a big rocket in order to get that into space. That would sort of be overkill and it would be extremely expensive to do that. Instead, a, a lot of projects that are going to space already for scientific, military, commercial purposes are willing to take along a shoebox or 10 shoeboxes along for the ride and then kick them out into orbit once they get to space. And so that means that we can launch CubeSats as piggyback uh, projects on larger missions, and this drastically reduces the cost in order to get there. Um, so it's, it's literally like we're, we're hitchhiking a ride to get to space. Okay, so this is really uh, transformative uh, because this opens up the possibility to work on projects that have much greater risk, risk tolerance than a large NASA spacecraft would have. Uh, and this opens it up to a range that is accessible to get to for small satellites uh, made by student teams at universities. Uh, so this really has a, been a big thing that has developed in, I would say, the last 15 years or so. Uh, there's sort of a, a clearinghouse for CubeSats that want to get to space called the CubeSat Launch Initiative. Uh, and this is a, a NASA program that matches up the CubeSats that want to go to space with the people who can provide a ride to get there. Uh, so they sort of provide the connections between the people who want to go to different orbits and the missions that are already going to those orbits. Uh, the CubeSat Launch Initiative has as one of its goals to launch a CubeSat that was produced by every single state. And so you can see from this map how that's going. Some states have done a lot of CubeSats, uh, some have done very few. Minnesota's up here with two. Uh, both of those are from our lab at the University of Minnesota. Uh, one of those has flown already and one is selected to be flown. And I'm going to tell you about both of those. Okay, so who's working on this at the University of Minnesota? Uh, this work takes place in the Small Satellite Research Lab. Uh, which is a, a very student focused laboratory. Uh, this is largely collaboration between the School of Physics and Astronomy and the Department of Aerospace Engineering. And there's a faculty member in each of those departments, uh, myself in physics and Demos Gebra in aerospace. Uh, but the student population of the lab is not limited to just those two departments. Uh, we actually have students from a lot of different departments in the CSE, including a lot of the engineering disciplines and we've even had technical writers from the CLA occasionally participate as well. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, students really do uh, all of the major tasks in this lab. So we have student project managers, we have student chief engineers, uh, each of our sub teams that work on the project is led by a student. Uh, the students even go out and present the project at conferences, including representing the project to our funding agencies. Oh, and as you can see in the upper right here, we have been able to keep this work going in a safe way during the COVID era. Uh, so we've found some ways to make sure that we can do this work safely with distancing and with a lot of care in how we're doing things in the lab. Uh, the students have produced one CubeSat already, and you can see in this photo in the center here, uh, some members of that team actually holding up the completed finished product ready to hand it over to NASA. 
Uh, now this CubeSat was launched in 2019 up to the space station where it stayed for a while before it was deployed from the space station in February 2020. So that was right before the pandemic. Uh, now this CubeSat, which was called Socrates, never talked back to us. We never heard from it. And so no communications were received. That was of course disappointing, uh, but there were a lot of things that happened successfully in order to get to that point. Uh, the students actually did produce a spacecraft that passed all of the benchmarks, all of the, the flight readiness tests on the ground, it's something that was deemed space worthy by NASA. And after we didn't hear back from it, the students got to go through the fun exercise of doing a really robust fault analysis to figure out what are the things that could have gone wrong to lead you to that particular outcome. And so this was a tremendous learning tool and I'm incredibly proud of the students who worked on this project and brought that to completion. It was really a, a major achievement to do that first one. Uh, what I'd like to do next is give you an idea of what it looks like to actually put a small spacecraft together. So let me show you a view of that. What you're seeing here are students actually working together in the clean room to assemble the CubeSat uh, for its final buildup. This is the one that was actually launched and deployed. And so you'll see here students from different departments working together based on what is going on at the time. Uh, there are electrical engineering students who are working on these electrical boards, doing testing of each of these boards as they're putting them together one by one. Uh, we now have a mechanical engineering student in here who's working a bit on the structure and a student from physics. She's working on the detector part. So the two of them are making sure that the detector, the X-ray camera, and the structure get integrated together well. Uh, we've got an aerospace engineering student in here now too, who is helping with that part as well. You'll see a lot of putting things together, testing things, taking them apart, putting them together again uh, to make sure that everything is hooked up correctly. And I wanna stress here that you know, if we were working on something that was a large NASA instrument, uh, you would never see students doing this particular work. Everything that you're seeing done in this video would have to be done by a NASA certified technician. Uh, so they would not even let me solder something on this if it were a, a bigger mission like that. But again, the risk tolerance that it is allowed by a CubeSat platform allows us to get students involved in doing this. Okay, we're starting to build up more of it now. So you're seeing more of the electronics boards come together, seeing more of the structure come on. Uh, I think I'm actually going to curtail the video here uh, because we go through a lot of testing as we go. Okay, and I'll just skip to the end. That's what it looks like when it's all put together. The only thing it's missing at the moment is the solar panels. And don't worry, those go on next. Okay, so what's coming up next for the team? I mentioned that we have a second CubeSat that is in development right now. We actually have a, a few different CubeSats that we're working on, but I'll, I'll pick out just one of them to tell you about. Uh, this is called the IMPRESS CubeSat. IMPRESS stands for the Impulsive Phase Rapid Energetic Solar Spectrometer. I won't make you memorize that acronym. Uh, and this is actually a pretty broad team that spans a few different institutions, but it's led here at the University of Minnesota and most of the work is happening in the small satellite research lab. Uh, this project has as its primary mission goal to try to investigate energy release at the very start of solar flares. And we're doing that by measuring very fast variations that happen in the X-ray time profiles. Uh, this is motivated by some preliminary work that was done by an astrophysics PhD student who is nearing graduation right now. Oh, and we are looking forward to a launch in 2023, uh, COVID permitting, our work has been a little bit slower due to the pandemic, uh, as has the work of all the University CubeSat teams in this program. Uh, but right now we're anticipating a 2023 launch. Okay, so I think with that, I will wrap it up. Uh, so to summarize, I told you a little bit about solar flares. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a place where understanding basic astrophysical processes meets societal impacts. Uh, so there's kind of two sides of that coin uh, in terms of why we should study these explosive releases of energy. And I also told you a little bit about some things that we're doing here at Minnesota to work on this. 
including the, the Small Satellite Research Lab, which is very student-centered. And I like to say that students do all the work in this lab. I just give some suggestions here and there. And you can look forward to our next launch coming up in 2023. Okay, and that's about it for me. So I think what I'll do next is I'll hand it over to Peter, who's going to tell you about a topic that's much closer to home, but I think in my opinion, no easier to study. So go ahead and take it away, Peter. Peter, I think you're muted and your video is still off. How about that? Am I, am I? Yes, I can see and hear you now and your slides look great. Go for okay, it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lindsay, for the uh, exciting journey to space and the introduction. It's my pleasure now to take you on a different kind of journey, uh, which is a journey back in time uh, to the age of dinosaurs or the Mesozoic. And as a paleontologist, um, I conduct field work uh, around the globe, and uh, I do so uh, in order to find uh, fossils, which then I can study with a variety of laboratory techniques, such as uh, the histology that you'll see here, or CT scanning that we have a great facility for here at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I do so in order to study not only the biodiversity of dinosaurs, that is how many species there were, how they were related to each other, and to the uh, dinosaurs alive today, which we call birds, which I'll return to in a moment, but also to answer some biological questions, such as um, how did some dinosaurs uh, evolve herbivory, uh, or how did their evolution of their growth patterns explain strange, exciting features of dinosaurs, such as the frills of horned dinosaurs, or indeed uh, explain how uh, some dinosaurs got to reach the incredible sizes, which are part of their public and scientific appeal. So today I'm gonna to offer a little glimpse into the latter topic, namely uh, showcasing a recent study that I organized together with an international team of researchers from the United States, Canada, um, China, and Argentina to look at how some dinosaurs, predatory dinosaurs in particular, animals like T-Rex that you see here, achieve the phenomenal sizes uh, that are so fascinating to us. And as I already mentioned, um, Dinosaurs are not actually extinct. Um, birds are nested, pun intended, within the uh, evolutionary tree of dinosaurs, as you can see here. They represent the only uh, branch shown here that survived the mass extinction 66 million years ago caused by a large uh, meteorite impact near what is uh, today Yucatan on the Mexican, uh, in Mexico. And, um, we can say that birds are dinosaurs in the same manner that we as humans are a branch of the evolutionary tree of primates and thus mammals. And thanks to fossil discoveries, we now know that many features that we tend to associate with birds are in fact inherited from dinosaurian ancestors and evolved many millions, sometimes tens or even a hundred million years before the birds themselves originated. Um, so the evidence for this of course comes from parts of the skeleton. And we know that uh, birds, for example, have wishbones. And these are also, uh, as you can see on the golden eagle here on the left, um, but these are also present in their dinosaurian relatives, such as in this small uh, velociraptor relative called Sinermythosaurus. Another unique feature that ties birds to some uh, theropod dinosaurs is the presence of a hand that has a reduced number of fingers so there are only three fingers in the hand of these animals, as you can see here, one, two, and three, uh, one, two, and three in the bird. Um, and even more uh, structurally, they have this um, swiveling wrist. They have a special structure of the wrist that actually allows the hand, or in the case of the golden eagle, the wing to actually fold back um, against the forearm uh, in a very unique motion um, seen in in birds and their closest relatives among the dinosaurs. And uh, within the last 20 years or so, we have found that the perhaps the most hallmark feature of birds, namely feathers, 
is actually something that evolved earlier. We can see the remains of the plumage coming off the forelimb here in this small dinosaur or around the neck. Uh, and we now know that uh, many dinosaurs actually had feathers. So another feature that was inherited by birds from a more distant dinosaurian ancestor. There are of course other features uh, which include the beaks of modern birds that are unique to birds themselves that evolved after birds branched off from the rest of the dinosaur evolutionary tree. And of course their relatives here like this animal have teeth. teeth. So using this combination of features um, across the swath of dinosaur biodiversity, uh, we can now actually come up with a notion that uh, some dinosaurs like T-Rex are in fact more closely related to birds like this chicken here than either of them is to more distantly related uh, carnivorous dinosaurs such as this uh, Carcharodontosaurus giganotosaurus, even though uh, the giganotosaurus that I show here is very similar in overall body size and proportions to Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, so in the same sense that we can say some uh, primates like chimpanzees are more closely related to us than they are to a more distantly related uh, primate like a, a baboon, the same way we can say that uh, birds are in fact predatory dinosaurs nested deeply within the dinosaur radiation. And that's important. Uh, piece of information because we now have living dinosaurs that we can actually ask biological questions about. Um, now, all the traits I talked about up till now, of course, are body parts that will fossilize under the right circumstances. Harder to get at are aspects of the biology, um, such as warm-bloodedness or especially growth, uh, which aren't readily preserved, but which are critical to understanding how, not only how some dinosaurs got so large, um, but how those great growth rates might be reflected in the biology of living birds. So growth, uh, when studied in animals, is basically the idea of looking at incremental changes in size as a function of time. Um, so here we have a bird species, the rhea from South America, uh, where we're measuring an increase in body mass relative to time as compared to an alligator, uh, the closest living relatives of birds uh, or, or of, uh, dinosaurs outside of birds. Um, and what we can see is whether we're measuring length as in the alligator or body mass, um, growth tends to follow a family of uh, growth curves that typically have a couple or three different phases uh, with an initial phase um, that usually asymptotes or slows down as the animals reach uh, adult size. Um, here in the bird data, you can see there's an initial short phase of very slow growth followed by very rapid growth, uh, an exponential phase, and then a sharp sort of turn as the growth asymptote is reached, and a much more gradual and slow and steady growth pattern in the alligator, more typical of reptiles. And you'll also notice in the alligator that you have a separation between the sexes. Males tend to grow larger and grow a little bit faster than do females. Um, the much more messy data that we see in the birds. Um, and what I want you to take home from this slide is the fact that living dinosaurs, namely birds, have this superpower of growing incredibly fast. Um, so this rhea, in rheas, we reach adult size in well under a year, adult size being 60 pounds. And as perhaps as an example of this superpower more familiar to you, you can think of chickens, which actually go from hatching to laying their own eggs in 18 weeks or less sometimes. So uh, growth rates are a fundamental aspect of understanding the biology of these animals, but how do we get at them, uh, especially when we're dealing with fossils? So the first variable we of course need is some measure of size and the standard in biology is to go after body mass. And uh, body mass can be inferred in extinct animals using basic biomechanical principles. So in land living animals, be they four-legged or two-legged, the body is supported by the limb bones. And it's so, so it stands to reason that some dimension of those limb bones, namely their circumference, should correlate with mass. And thankfully, most land living animals follow the same engineering principles 
um, which allow us then to develop broad correlations across all animals between bone measurements and body mass, and then use those to extrapolate or interpolate the size of dinosaurs. So here's such a curve um, where you see the gray dots representing uh, living taxa, closely defining a, a um, nice correlation between body size and bone circumference, and then extrapolated from that the size of various extinct dinosaurs. Um, now, this gives us um, a size or mass, but it's not enough uh, for us to infer growth rates. For that, we also need some measure of time so that we can sort of estimate how much mass is accrued over time during the growth of a single animal or a single species. Uh, and since the skeleton is composed of growing tissues, that is really going to be the best source of clues for us. So most of you are probably familiar with some age-related aspects of the skeleton in humans, such as the closure of growth plates at the ends of the uh, major limb bones during the late teens, um, or closure of the fontanelles, the openings in babies' heads that occur some nine or 18 months after birth. But if we dive deeper into the skeleton and look at the internal microstructure of bones, there are even better clues to an animal's growth record. Um, so looking at histological slides of uh, thin ground cross sections of bones, what we can see is a number of features such as their vascularity, that is basically the degree to which the bone is pervaded by uh, vascular canals, the, the canals that bring in the blood supply and the nutrients to the bone um, with higher degrees of vascularity, generally uh, correlating with higher growth, uh, growth rates for that particular bone. However, if we're looking at uh, growth rates for the entire organism, there's another set of features that are of interest to us. And these are usually uh, what we call cyclical uh, growth marks uh, in the form of, for example, lines of arrested growth shown here as this dark line, uh, a point where the bone stops growing. And we know from uh, looking at the uh, bone cross sections of living animals that these are roughly annual. So they serve as a nice growth marker. We can count them up much the same way you can count up tree rings um, and get an estimate of how old an animal was at the time of death. Now there is one major caveat to this, which unlike tree rings, is that the internal part of the bone, the marrow cavity, which you see in black here, also expands as the bone is growing, thereby erasing some of the innermost lines of arrested growth. So we need to do some math or some statistics at the end of this process to infer what, how much of that growth record is gone. But the basic principle is that much like in dendrochronology or the counting of tree rings, we can look at these annual growth marks and get an assessment of both the age of the animal at time of death, but also of the size of the limb bones at earlier ages. So now that we have, uh, but of course, uh, as, as this requires bone cross sections, this is a somewhat destructive analytical process requiring us to either saw into the bones uh, to take a cross section as you see in the movie on the left, or sometimes when we try to uh, minimize the damage to the bones as on this T-Rex femur, we use a diamond tipped drill core to take out a small or thin plug of bone in order to create those cross sections. Um, so this of course limits the number of specimens that is available to us, um, but if with sufficient number of specimens, we can generate those growth curves uh, that I showed you earlier for the living species we can generate comparable ones uh, for dinosaurs. And uh, just to show you what that looks like, here is uh, sort of a growth study that I was involved with now some 15 years ago, where uh, we looked at the growth patterns in T-Rex, as well as three of its closest relatives among the Tyrannosaurid family. Um, and what you'll see here is that um, after an initial rather slow phase of growth, the, called the lag phase, uh, both T-Rex and its relatives show an increase in growth, an exponential amount of growth um, that then tapers off towards adult size um, that, that's reached somewhere 
around 18 to 20 years of age. So uh, T-Rex, which is thought to weigh somewhere between five and nine tons, depending on which um, particular equation you're using, would have reached that size in 18 years or in the same amount of time it takes us to reach adulthood. So quite a phenomenal growth rate. And uh, apart from this initial uh, slow lag phase of growth, what this very much looks like is that avian pattern, that bird-like growth pattern that I showed you for the rhea, quite different from what we see in crocodilians and other reptiles. So we can say that T-Rex certainly had a capacity for growth similar to that, uh, what we see in modern birds. Um, but is that true of all dinosaurs? Um, is that a general pattern in all dinosaurs? Or is that more unique to perhaps some set of di dinosaurs, including T-Rex and living relatives for birds? Now to answer that type of question, one of the most powerful tools we have is to make a comparison to a species with a similar biology and then ask whether that species arrived at that biology, in this case being a large predator, by the same path T-Rex did, or did it take a different path? And in the case of T-Rex, we can look to the Carcharodontosaurids, like Giganotosaurus that I talked about in an earlier slide, as a suitable comparison. Carcharodontosaurids reach similar sizes of between three and a half to seven tons and also have a similar body plan to Tyrannosaurus with a large head and a short, a short arms and would have been similar, uh, occupied a similar uh, ecological role as apex predators just at an earlier time in the Cretaceous than when T-Rex and its relatives were around. Now, um, this is where we head back to the field. As luck would have it, um, with a group of Argentinian colleagues, uh, we discovered and excavated a new species of Carcharodontosaurid between 2011 and 2014. Um, and you can see initial excavation here on the left using a lot of power tools um, and uh, removing something like six to nine feet of overburden back, back wall here. And then uh, we were rewarded with a very nice skeleton of a large Carcharodontosaur you can see some of the limb bones outlined here. Um, the animal is quite complete. Uh, shown in white here are the parts of the skeleton we have recovered, including a very nice skull, uh, short forelimbs, which are the most complete known for this group of animals, and importantly, some leg bones, including this beautiful cross-section of the thigh bone, which allowed us to take a histological sample uh, and make a direct comparison to uh, T. rex. So what does the growth of this animal look like? Well, somewhat surprisingly, it's quite different from what we see in T. rex. We have the new Carcharodontosaurid species shown on the right uh, with T. rex shown on, or sorry, T. rex on the right with the new Carcharodontosaurid on the left. Um, and just to summarize sort of the data that we found from looking at the histological cross sections, um, we see that T. rex again, reaching adulthood somewhere around uh, 20 years of age or before 20 years of age and living some 27 to 33 years. Uh, those uh, ranges in those estimates come from fitting different types of functions uh, to our data, basically to infer how many of those um, uh, growth lines are missing due to medullary cavity expansion or marrow cavity expansion that I talked about. Um, we don't need to bother with the details. The main point is the Carcharodontosaurid is not only much, much older than the Tyrannosaur, but would have grown uh, much slower, uh, generally showing a more reptilian growth pattern of slow uh, growth over a longer period of time and very small increments of growth from year to year. Um, and so basically we can say that the uh, T-Rex pattern is much more similar to the bird example I showed you earlier, whereas the Carcharodontosaurid is much more typical of a slow growing reptilian pattern. And in fact, at this point um, in time, this is the oldest theropod dinosaur that we have uh, any sample from. Um, and then also the, one of the oldest dinosaurs yet sampled histologically. So very different patterns uh, in these two iconic species. Um, and importantly, we didn't just compare these two animals, 
we undertook was actually the lost electrical sampling of theropods yet known over nine species and over uh, 30 different sections of bones. Um, and what we found is that the patterns we see in our two iconic giant species are uh, consistent with a more broad evolutionary pattern, which is that um, the closer animals are to birds in, in an evolutionary sense, animals like T-Rex, um, the more bird-like their growth pattern is. So the closer an, a species is in phylogenetically or evolutionarily to being a bird, the rat more rapid its growth, whereas earlier or more ancestral species tend to grow more slowly or in a more reptilian fashion. So what this tells us essentially is that um, while some dinosaurs grew fast, there is a phylogenetic or evolutionary control on this. Um, the more ancestral the species is, the more reptilian its growth pattern is. Uh, the more derived or close to birds it happens to be, the more bird-like that its growth rate is. Um, so taken together, we can say that the sort of superpower birds have to grow incredibly fast is at least partially inherited from their uh, dinosaurian ancestors, um, although not fully. Uh, if we think back onto that T-Rex growth curve, we remember there was that initial slow period of growth um, and it seems that that's been erased among living birds. So sometime after birds um, split off from the rest of the dinosaurs, they added a little boost to their, um, to their growth um, uh, capacity. And that's probably one of the features that allowed them to survive the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous that took out all the rest of their um, dinosaurian relatives. Um, we know that because by studying other groups of organisms that survive mass extinction boundaries. It's the combination of fast growth, small body size, and uh, fast reproduction rates that are, what are generally correlated with survival. So part of the uh, story to birds being the only lineage surviving to the modern day, the only dinosaurian lineage, I should say, surviving to the modern day, seems to be related to growth rates that were at least partially inherited from much deeper in their dinosaur ancestry. And with that, I'll say thanks to everybody and uh, open the floor to questions. Yep, thank you so much, Professor McVicky. And I'd now like to introduce, um, invite Rob Graber and Lindsay Gleasoner to turn their cameras and mics back on. And we'll be taking as many audience questions as we're able to before we hit one o'clock. If you haven't already put your questions down in the Q&A box, uh, last call, put them in there and Rob will be getting to as many questions as he's able. So go ahead and take it away, Rob. All right, thanks. So thank you both for a really interesting talk. Um, we do have some good questions in the, in the Q&A, so let's get started. Uh, first of all, from the very aptly named Carrie Sun, uh, this is for Pre Professor Gleesner. What was the root cause, or were you able to determine the root cause of the communication failure? I'm sure you get that question pretty much every time you talk about it. So, and more than one person did ask it. So, right, yeah, this is a, a great question, and it's something I could talk about at length for hours. <laughs> uh, but I'll just kind of give the the quick summary of it. Uh, we believe that the problem was due to a kind of marginal power budget in the early stages of the mission right after turn on. You know, we had a really robust uh, power budget with a lot of margin for the main scientific phase, uh, but there's that early phase where you're first deployed, you have to deploy your panels, you have to actually turn and face the sun, you have to establish communications for the first time. Uh, and you, we just didn't have enough power margin in that phase. So that's what we think the root cause was. All right. Thank you. Um, this one's interesting to me. It, it, uh, Professor McAvicki, I, I, I'm, uh, has your how has your work or research uh, been affected by the pandemic? I'm assuming uh, that some of the field work has at least been impacted. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so uh, field work has been in, impacted, um, but I think uh, the bigger impact has actually been an inability to travel. So um, like the Carcodonosaurus skeleton that I, I talked about is at a rather small museum in, in the province of Neuquén in Argentina. Um, to actually study it with my colleagues, I have to physically go there. Um, and that's been impossible for the last year and a half. 
So that's been, I would say, the biggest uh, single sort of slowdown, the inability to either go to uh, institutions to look at specimens or even to be able to loan them. Most uh, museums have shut down operations. Um, so even loaning material has been very hard. So getting access to material has been almost harder than going in the field. I actually made it out to the field twice in, in both ah. in November and, and in um, and in the summer um, following the protocols at the university. So that, that wasn't as big a challenge. All right, thank you. Um, Lowell Stolte asks, how many CubeSats are currently orbiting and how long do they stay in orbit? And I think with an eye toward space debris and the difficulty of managing so many things in orbit. Sure, yeah, it's definitely the case that with uh, more accessibility to space, you get more stuff in space. <laughs> that <laughs> definitely does follow. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but there probably is over a thousand CubeSats, I think, by now. Um, that That is actually still a small fraction of the total amount of, of space debris that's up there already. Uh, the biggest source of space debris at the, the moment and for the foreseeable future is uh, definitely debris from collisions of bigger things. Those don't happen very often, but when they do, then you, when you produce hundreds of thousands of pieces at the, the same time. I think in the CubeSat range, um, there's probably something on the order of 100,000 or something like that, things that are in space. Um, in terms of how long they stay there, uh, we do have to guarantee that our CubeSat is not going to stay up forever. Well, nothing would stay up for forever, but we have to guarantee that it will deorbit or essentially burn up. Uh, within 25 years. And so that's part of um, even the earliest stages of the of the project. We have to put that in our very first proposal, uh, but we also have to come up with a robust plan for that uh, before the CubeSat launch initiative will actually okay. give us a ride. Interesting. Um, Professor Rakovicki, I think you I think you commented on this in one of your last slides, but someone has also asked uh, about the the rapid maturation of birds as opposed to the delayed, uh, well, I forget what you called it, the plateau period or the delayed period at the beginning of the dinosaur maturation. Do we have any additional understanding of that or? We do. Um, so uh, sort of, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here one more time. So the thing about birds is they don't play by the same rules because they grow so fast, um, but we are looking at similar data for birds. Um, now bird bones are very rare in the fossil record um, and so we don't get to cut them up um, the way we do with the, the dinosaurs. But what you see on the screen here is in fact a, um, a synchrotron generated uh, cross section of a bird bone that would be about uh, five or six millimeters across here. And so you're looking at uh, reconstruction of the internal vascularity on the slide in the right. So we're basically trying to get at some of those parameters I talked about related to growth and physiology uh, using a slightly different technique um, because we're not allowed to destructively sample these uh, specimens and also because they grow in a different way than, than dinosaurs do basically because of their very massive growth rate. Um, so we know that some, somewhere about 100 uh, or not quite 100 million years ago, much closer to the diversity of living birds, there, is a, there seems to be one or more shifts internally in growth rate that result in a, in a repatterning of the, the histology. So this work is ongoing. Um, we have sampled as many birds as we could get from right around the end of the Cretaceous to try and understand just exactly how growth rates in birds may have um, affected their survival at, at that extinction yeah. boundary. Interesting. Okay, and uh, another question for uh, Professor Gleasoner, and I'm thinking this is probably a fairly common question. Uh, uh, is there any connection between solar flares and earthly climate change uh, discussions? It comes up a lot in those discussions. Sure, yeah, that is indeed a, a very common question and it's one worth asking. Um, you, there, the, the clear answer is no, 
Um, the more nuanced answer is uh, there are some ways in which the solar cycle can affect climate patterns on Earth in some really specific ways, uh, but there's nothing that's been happening on the sun in the, the last hundred years that would explain the warming of the planet that we've seen. And um, so the sun is not the source of that. Okay, thank you. Um, Joel, how are we looking for time? Do we have time for a couple more, you think? Yeah, I think you can give each one one more at least. Okay, um, let's see it. Well, I guess this is a, a pretty pretty standard question for in the uh, dinosaur community, but is based on your current understanding, do you subscribe to the idea that the classic, you know, traditional pictures of dinosaurs are what the word they used is under feathered? Um, so the dinosaurs probably looked more like birds than what we see in children's books and on cartoons and. Um, yeah, so uh, we know that for some theropod dinosaurs, the ones very closely related to birds, like the one I showed the slide of, um, they would have had a full plumage. Uh, we have good enough preservation that basically we know everything from behind the, uh, the mouth and down to the ankles would have had plumage on it, um, so much so that we can actually infer colors for some of these things based on, hmm. it's not, not the actual feather that's preserved, but it's the melanocytes, the little um, color packets, the cells of, of color uh, that, that are actually preserved and, and allow us to visualize these. Um, once you get a little further away from birds, uh, evolutionarily speaking, it gets a little more complicated. Uh, we do see some herbivorous dinosaurs that we always thought were scaly have, in fact, have some kind of filaments. Uh, some of them even look like little bottle brushes. Um, but then there are other dinosaurs like your classical duckbills you can see in any major natural history museum that we know had scaly skin. Um, and so, um, so we know that the, the evolution of integument is, is probably a lot more complex than just a single origin of feathers, um, but rather is, is more variable throughout all dinosaurs. Thank you. And then uh, maybe our final question, and it's maybe a larger question, we can get a, a sense of it, but in what ways is our understanding of this is for Professor Gleisner, in what way is our understanding of the sun important to our understanding of the possibility of life elsewhere in the galaxy, the universe? I think it's really important. Um, the sun is only one star, but it's the one that we can study really, really well in a, a whole lot of detail. Uh, and so I, I think it's really important for understanding the prospects for life on other planets around other stars. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different things that you need in order to develop life, at least the sort of life that we're familiar with. Um, and the, the radiation that comes from the star uh, is, is one of those things. So if you have stellar flares that are happening so frequently and with so much energy that they're essentially wiping out whatever fledgling life is starting to develop on a planet, that's maybe not the star you want to look at if you're trying to, to find ET. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah, there are ongoing efforts to try to take the things that we're learning, um, not only about the sun, but about the rest of our solar system in a tribe and apply those to other systems as well. Excellent. Thank you very much to both of you. Joelle? Thanks so much. I'd like to give a final big thank you to Rob for moderating all the many wonderful questions that you submitted. There were a lot to choose from, so thank you so much for submitting those, as well as to Professors Gleesener uh, and McVicky for being with us today. They spent a lot of time preparing for their talks, uh, and we're really pleased that we were able to share their amazing research with you today. A reminder that we will be sending an email out in the coming days that will have a link to today's recording. Uh, please feel free to share it with anyone you think would be interested. The more people who get to learn about their work, the better. Uh, and if you're interested in additional events coming up at the college, you can always check out uh, the CSE events calendar. It's got a really robust listing of events that's always changing and being added to at csc.umn.edu slash college slash events. And I'll also throw a quick shout out to the CSC YouTube channel. Uh, if you're interested in seeing more lectures from the Curiosity Drives Progress series 
recordings of many of the past events that we've done, especially this year uh, while we've been virtual. Um, the link to the YouTube channel will also be in that follow-up email I mentioned. So a final thank you again to our speakers and to Rob for doing a wonderful job moderating and to all of you for making the time to attend today. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon.